morning, and welcome to the worship service of the First Christian Church of Hessville on May 22nd, 2022. And as I sat down and I looked at the screen, it got me thinking. So this is just right off the top of my head. Anybody know what that is? What kind of butterfly is it? Tiger swallowtail. I'm looking at that, and I'm, okay, now that bounces me to how I start my morning off this time of year. I get on my bike and I ride. And the thing that I see when I'm on my bike riding is I see all these fantastic, phenomenal creations that God made. The trees are unending. The species are unending. The bugs crawling across the ground, it's unending. The butterflies, everything, spectacular, awesome, unbelievable stuff he did. Now think about this. I often think to myself, how in all the world do you even think of something like that? How do you come up with that? And then, okay... Let's go one step further. Let's make it do this and it flies. How spectacular is just the thought of inventing something like that butterfly? As simple as it is, how complex it is, phenomenal it is, and we are part of his creation. All of these spectacular things that we get to take in, we worship an amazing, phenomenal, awe-inspiring God. Amen? Amen? How about we all rise and I'm going to go to him in a word of prayer. We are blessed, Heavenly Father, to be a part of your, be a part of your creation, a part that can understand so many of these things that you created for us to see and to be a part of and to enjoy how spectacular and awesome you are dear God how thankful each one of us are that we know you personally and that you know us personally we thank you that you know our names we thank you that you knew us before we were born we thank you that you've been with us through our lives. We thank you that you opened our eyes and our ears and our heart and our soul, our mind, to your reality. We thank you for the opportunity to be able to spend eternity with you. And we thank you through which the vehicle that was provided, the vehicle that allows, gives us the chance to spend eternity in heaven your Son, Jesus the Christ, our Lord and Savior. We thank you that you sent him here. It's so sad that he had to endure what he had to endure because of us, but he did it for us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for his life, his death, his resurrection, and now his ascension back to heaven, waiting to meet each one of us as an individual face to face. We look forward to the day that he returns. We look forward to the day that we get to meet him. And we ask, dear God, that you forgive us where we have failed, where we have faltered, where we have sinned. Strengthen and guide and direct us. Show us the way. Keep us on that straight and narrow. We ask this through Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we got sunshine outside today, so there's going to be some sunshine in my soul today, too. 549, verses 1, 2, and 3. There is sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than glows in any earthly sky. For Jesus is my light. Oh, there's sunshine in my soul, blessed sunshine in my soul. 
While the peaceful, happy moments, happy moments roll, when Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is music in my soul today, a carol to my King. And Jesus, listening, can hear the songs I cannot sing. Oh, there's sunshine in my soul, blessed sunshine in my soul. While the peaceful, happy moment, happy moments roll, when Jesus shows his smiling face. There is sunshine in my soul. There is gladness in my soul today. And hope and praise and love for blessings which he gives me now. For joys laid up above. sunshine in my soul, blessed sunshine in my soul, while the peaceful happy moment, happy moments roll, when Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. Thank you. Please be seated. We continue in song. Page number 574, Oh, How I Love Jesus, verses 1 and 3. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can hear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. Abide with me. Page number 808, verses 1 and 3. I'm sorry, verses 1 and 4. Abide with me for those the evening tide the darkness deepened Lord with me Skies as morning breaks. 
wigs and earth stained shadows flee in life and death O oh Lord abide with me and our communion song is 10,000 angels on page 349 Verses 1 and 4. They found the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They led him through the streets in shame. They spent... They spat upon the Savior's pure. He could have called ten thousand angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called ten thousand angels, but he died alone for you and me. Now when the even has come, he sat down with the twelve, and as they did eat, he said, Verily I say to you, that one of you shall betray me. They were exceedingly sorrowful, and began every one of them to say, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, That he who dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth, as it is written of him, but woe unto the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. And then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? And said unto him, Thou hast said. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remissions of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until that day I drink it new with you, in my Father's kingdom. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for another opportunity to come before you to partake of the Lord's Supper. Help us to remember at this time that the bread that we are about to partake represents Jesus' torn body, which he gave freely for each one of us that we might have life eternal through his sacrifice. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. Thank you for knowing us. Thank you for caring, and thank you for loving. Even though we are sinners, you came and gave your all to save each one of us. We ask this through your name. Amen. My dear Heavenly Father, as we continue in prayer, may we be also mindful of this cup and how it represents the precious blood of your Son and our Savior. Your word says that without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. So we thank you, Father, as we remember and pray your blessings on those who partake. I ask and pray it all in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Our scripture reading for today is going to be taken out of the book of Galatians, chapter 6, verse 7. If you can all stand and read this together. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. All right, let's go to God. Father God, we are so thankful for this opportunity that we get to be here together as a family and be able to worship your name and be able to learn more about your word, Father. Father, I ask, you that, I ask that you help us open our ears and open our hearts to the message and allow us to receive it with confidence and be able to learn from it. Father, give Dan the strength that he needs in order to be able to preach a message that needs to be preached, Father. I say all this in the name of Jesus Christ. The church says, Amen. morning we're going to be looking at the book of Ezekiel and we invite you to turn to Ezekiel chapter 36 verses 24 through 28 to begin our thoughts today. Ezekiel chapter 36 beginning with verse 24. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers so you will be my people and I will be your God. The name Ezekiel means God strengthens, or God will strengthen. And this name appears nowhere else in the Old Testament. It is unique to this book. Ezekiel was a prophet of the exile. He is among those in Babylon and speaks to the Jews that were there. He was carried away into captivity with a group that went in 597 B.C., well before the city of Jerusalem finally fell and the majority of people were carried off. He prophesies to the Jews of the captivity from about 592 B.C. to 570 B.C. Now, the captivity of Judah takes place in three stages. First, in 606, some captives are taken to Babylon. Again, in 597, more captives are taken, about 10,000, along with Ezekiel. And then, finally, in 586, Jerusalem falls and is destroyed. Ezekiel is present in Babylon at the same time as Daniel. And by the way, they are about the same age. But Daniel is in the palace and Ezekiel is in the country. And so we don't know if their paths ever crossed. We also know that he was a contemporary of Jeremiah, who was about 20 years older. He had a home on the river Chebar, about 50 miles north of Babylon, where the elders of Judah were accustomed to meet. He was a priest, but was called to be a prophet, and so he never served as a priest. His wife died in the ninth year of the captivity as a sign that Jerusalem would fall. 
but Ezekiel was not allowed to mourn her death. He had a very bold message. And though the Jews were captives at this time, they were treated more as colonists than as slaves. They had religious freedom and gave up their idolatry during this period. They also sought out the books of law, established the canon of the Old Testament, and began synagogue worship during this period of captivity. Ezekiel is responsible for the preservation of religion among the Jews during the captivity. And when the people would not listen to his words, he acted out the message of God before them thus becoming a sign unto them. He saw the glory of the Lord depart from the temple, but he also saw, at least at a distance prophetically, the glory of God return to Jerusalem and the temple during the kingdom age. Christ is depicted in this book as a tender twig, that becomes a stately cedar as the king who has the right to rule, chapter 21, and the true shepherd who will deliver and feed his his flock, chapter 34. The most common designation for Ezekiel in the book is son of man the designation that Jesus used most often in referring to himself. In the kingdom age, we are told that Jerusalem will be called Jehovah Shammah, meaning the Lord is there. The book of Ezekiel is very similar to Revelation in that it does not so much predict events as tells about visions that the prophet sees. He remains in body at the river Chebar, but is transported in spirit to Jerusalem both in the present and in the future. Some of the figures that are found in Ezekiel are also found in the book of Revelation. It has been said that Isaiah is the prophet of the Son, Jeremiah the prophet of the Father, and Ezekiel, the prophet of the Spirit. Let's look then at the background. First of all, of course, the author of this book is Ezekiel, the prophet and priest. The period is from about 565 to 571 B.C. And the purpose of the book is to tell the Jews in exile about the destruction of Jerusalem the destruction of the surrounding nations, and to predict the restoration of Israel as well. God is the key person in this book, God the glorious Lord, and of course Ezekiel, God's prophet. Here's what we find in the book. First of all, Ezekiel's call in chapters 1 through Three. He first of all sees a vision of cherubim and then is given his commission in chapter 3. And then the book speaks about the destruction of Jerusalem in chapters 4 through 24. And chapter 4 we see the siege of Jerusalem and it is portrayed in Ezekiel's life where he is told to lay on one side for 390 days and then on the other side for 40 days, predicting what is going to happen in the way of famine and the fall of Jerusalem. Then he is told in chapter 5 to shave his hair, speaking of the complete destruction of Jerusalem. Chapter 6 denounces idolatry. Chapter 7 and 8 show the abominations that are taking place in Jerusalem. 
in chapters 9 and 10, we have a vision of the glory of God departing from the temple. And even though Ezekiel is in Babylon, he sees the glory of God through a vision depart from the temple. In chapter 11, we're told that the evil rulers will be judged. In chapter 12, we find the removal of household goods. In chapters 13 through 15 is a warning to lying prophets in the vision of the burning vine compared to John chapter 15 where God wants fruit from his people. Chapter 16 is the parable of the unfaithful wife, speaking of Judah as an unfaithful wife to God. Chapter 17 and 18, the parable of the two eagles. 19 and 20, the two sisters. 21 and 22, it tells of how Israel will be scattered among the nations. And finally, in 23 and 24, we are given the parable of the boiling cauldron and the death of Ezekiel's wife in which he is told not to mourn. Chapters 25 through 32 give predictions against foreign nations and cities. Ammon, Moab, Edom, and Philistia in chapter 25. And then the city of Tyre in chapters 26 through 28. And in chapter 28, he prophesies to the king of Tyre, which is really an expression to Satan who is behind the king of Tyre. And then, and finally, in chapters 29 to 32, he prophesies about the fall of Egypt. Chapters 30. 3 through 48 speak of the, the restoration time. Finally, in chapter 33, Jerusalem falls, and then God prophesies in chapter 34 through Ezekiel against the shepherds of Israel. In chapter 36, he says that the mountains of Israel are going to be blessed. And in chapter 37, we have that great uh, that great picture of the valley of dry bones in which God says to Ezekiel, can these bones live again? And they all come together and get flesh on them and sure enough they do live again. In the end of this chapter, we have two sticks, Israel and Judah, who it is predicted will be reunited one, under one shepherd king. And then in chapters 38 and 39, we have the restoration of Judah to the promised land and the invaders destroyed, Gog and Magog. Verses, chapters 40 through 48, speak of the messianic times and describe the messianic temple. And also in verses 45 through 48, the division of the land. Now, some of the key verses that are found in, uh, in the book of Ezekiel include chapter 18, verse 20. Here it says, The person who sins will die. The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment for the son's iniquity. The wicked will be upon the, the righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. In verse 32 of that same chapter, God says, "For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies," declares the Lord God. Therefore, repent and live." Chapter 22, verses 29 and 30. The people of the land have practiced oppression and committed robbery. And they have wronged the poor and needy and have oppressed the sojourner without justice. I searched for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand in the gap before me for the land 
so that I would not destroy it, but I found no one. Chapter 36, verses 24 through 28. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers, so you will be my people, and I will be your God. And then in chapter 36, verses 33 through 35, Thus says the Lord God, On the day that I cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited, and the waste places will be rebuilt. The desolate land will be cultivated instead of being a desolation in the sight of everyone who passes by. They will say, this desolate land has become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste, desolate, and ruined cities are fortified and inhabited. Chapter 37 is the vision of the Valley of Dry Bones where Ezekiel says uh, he sees all these bones and is told that they can live again. And the key phrase that's found 70 times throughout the whole book of Ezekiel is, they shall know that I am the Lord. Now, what are the lessons that we can learn from this unusual book. Well, first of all, the responsibility of having the message of the Lord. That's one of the most important things that we learn from the book of Ezekiel. In chapter 3, verses 17 through 21, he says this, Son of man, I have appointed you a watchman to the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, warn them from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you do not warn him or speak out to warn the wicked from his wicked way, that he may live, that wicked man shall shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet if you have warned the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness, or from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered yourself. Again, when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I place an obstacle before him, he will die. Since you have not warned him, he shall die in his sin, and his righteous deeds uh, which he has done shall not be remembered, but his blood I will require at your hand. However, if you have warned the righteous man and the righteous should not, that the righteous should not sin and he does, he does not sin, he shall surely live because he took warning and you have delivered yourself. Those who have the message of God, like you and I, folks, have a responsibility for declaring it to others. And those who hear are responsible for responding as they should. So God places a responsibility on those of us who have the gospel and upon those who hear the gospel as well. A second lesson that we learn from this book is how sin destroys men and nations. And this is found particularly in chapter 9. Sin destroys men. Verses 1 through 6. Then he cried out in my hearing with a loud voice, saying, Draw near, O executioners of the city. 
each with his destroying weapon in his hand. Behold, six men came from the direction of the upper gate which faces north, each with his shattering weapon in his hand, and among them was a certain man clothed in linen with a writing case in, at his loins. And they went in and stood beside the bronze altar. Then the glory of God of Israel went up from the cherubim which were on it, where, which had it, it had been, to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed in linen, at whose loins was the writing case. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, even through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations which are being committed in its midst. But to the others he said in my hearing, Go through the city after him and strike. Do not let your eye have pity, and do not spare. Utterly slay old men, young men, maidens, little children, and women, and do not touch any man on whom is the mark, and you shall start from my sanctuary. So they started with the elders who were before the temple. Sin destroys people. And this is what God says in the New Testament as well. The wages of sin is death. Sin also destroys nations. And that is illustrated in both the nations of Israel and Judah. Here in chapter 9 and verses 9 and 10, Then he said to me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is very, very great. The land is filled with blood. The city is full of perversion. For they say, The Lord has forsaken the land, and the Lord does not see. But as for me, my eye will have no pity, nor will I spare. But I will bring their conduct upon their head. Every empire that has ever been great has been brought low by its sin. Greece, Rome, Germany, Russia, China, Japan. That's what we read together today when we read, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. We should not think that America will fail to fall in the same way should the Lord tarry to return. A third thing that we learn is that of individual responsibility. Chapter 18 there again. What do you mean by using the proverb concerning the land saying the fathers eat the sour grapes but the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, declares the Lord God, you are surely not going to use this proverb in Israel anymore. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins will die. Every man is responsible for his own sin. God does not hold us responsible for the sins of others. Yes, we do suffer for the sins of others as a nation, as a family, or perhaps because they sinned against us. But God will judge us only for our own sins, not for the sins of others. Fourthly, the power of God which points to the certainty of judgment. Chapter 25, verses 15 through 17. Thus says the Lord God, Because the Philistines have acted in revenge and have taken vengeance with scorn of soul to destroy with everlasting enmity, therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will stretch out my hand against the Philistines, even cut off the Cherethites and destroy the remnant of the seacoast. I will execute great vengeance on them 
with wrathful rebukes, and they will know that I am the Lord when I lay my vengeance on them. God's judgment is certain. Fifthly, the restoration of the Jews. The Jews are going to have, first of all, their land restored. Chapter 37. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We are completely cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people. I will pour my spirit within you and you will come to life and I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. Their land will be restored. Their city will be restored. In Jerusalem, in, uh, in chapter 48, verses 15 through 22, it says that Jerusalem is to be rebuilt and established. The city will be given 5,000 cubits by 25,000 cubits. And Christ will reign over the world from Jerusalem. Hear what Zechariah chapter 14 verses 9 through 11 says. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. In that day the Lord will be the only one, and his name the only one. All the land will be changed into a plain from Geba to Rimmon, south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem will rise and remain on its site from Benjamin's gate as far as the place of the first gate to the corner gate, and from the tower of Hanal to the king's wine presses. People will live in it, and there will no longer be a curse, for Jerusalem will dwell in security. Now that sure hasn't happened yet, folks. Jerusalem surely is not dwelling in security yet, but one day that will happen it will dwell in security. God says it will happen. The temple will also be restored, chapters 40 through 44. These are a description of the millennial temple. It is unlike any other temple that has occupied Jerusalem. Where the Shekinah glory of God departed from the old temple, chapters 9 and 10, it returns to the reconstructed temple in chapter 43. There is reinstituted the Levitical priesthood. And all of this is to be a part of the millennial reign of Christ. One last lesson. Everything that is done is for the glory of God. This is spoken of often in the book. In chapters 1 through 3, for instance, Ezekiel sees the glory of God. In chapter 8, verse 4, it says, And behold, the glory of God of Israel was there like the appearance which I saw on the plain. Chapter 9, verse 3, Then the glory of the God of Israel went up from the cherub on which it had been to the threshold of the temple. Chapter 10, verse 19, when the cherubim departed, they lifted their wings and rose up from the earth in my sight with the wheels beside them. And they stood still at the entrance of the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the God of Israel hovered over them. Chapter 39, verse 21. 
I will set my glory among the nations, and all the nations will see my judgment which I have executed and my hand which I have laid on them. In chapter 43, verse 2, Behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the way of the east, and his voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. Again, that key phrase, they shall know that I am the Lord. Chapter 3, verse 1 sums up what we learn from the, the book of Ezekiel. Son of man, eat what you find. Eat the scroll and go and speak to the house of Israel. Honey ants survive difficult times by their dependence upon certain members of the group that act as social stomachs. These honey pots, as they are known, actually take in so much nectar that they swell into little round berries, hardly able to move. When food and water become scarce for the whole group, they sustain the entire colony by dispensing what they have stored in their own bodies. So, friends, you and I are called upon to fill our lives with the Word of God, for only as we have eaten can we give its nourishing blessing to those around us. May we do so, even as did Ezekiel. If you're outside the Lord this morning, we come to our invitation time and offer you the opportunity to come to Christ, to name Him as your Lord and Savior, to announce before others that you believe He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And in your faith to accept him as such and to be immersed into him for the remission of your sin. If this is a choice you've made in your life and would be a part of God's family here, we'd welcome that as well. We invite you to come as we stand together and sing our hymn of invitation, hymn number 920.
uh, deck for cards to sign at the back. The Bible study this week in the book of Deuteronomy. We hope you'll join us for that. Uh, among our ill, my brother, uh, brother Wilmer is back at home and, and doing better, so we're happy for that. We've had others that have been on our, our prayer list that are uh, improving. Grateful for that. If you know of others, please let us know so that we can be praying for them. Uh, good to see you all today. Try to take care of yourself and I look for you again next week. Let's bow our heads together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to come together today. We ask that you would bless us as we leave this place. Uh, give us your encouragement. Give us your strength. Help us, Father, to walk in your way. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.